Hi, good evening, everyone, uh, and welcome to this uh, Institute of Physics Yorkshire branch um, public seminar. So, um, my name's Lee Thompson. I'm a professor of particle physics at the University of Sheffield, and I organise um, these uh, talks on behalf of the Sheffield branch. Uh, what we're doing this semester is something slightly different, and uh, the Yorkshire universities are getting together and each uh, organizing one of these events uh, roughly once per month. I'll say a little bit about the next event at the end of uh, tonight's seminar. Um, I should say that we're all keen to get back to uh, the uh, in-person um, talks and seminars, um, uh, which I'm sure many of the people connected here tonight have been to in the past. I have to confess though, on this particular occasion, I'm actually quite glad given the weather outside that I'm warm and uh, warm and dry at home and I don't have any traveling to do at the end of this so um, be grateful for small mercies I guess tonight but anyway um, I'm delighted to welcome uh, Kate Nicholson. Um, Kate is here tonight to talk to us about the physics if you like behind physics and chemistry behind pigments um, and uh, how pigments are perceived uh, Kate uh, is currently in uh, Applied Sciences at uh, the University of Northumbria, Northumbria University, uh, but uh, previously studied chemistry at Durham University, both as an undergraduate and PhD student. Uh, she specialised there in crystal growth theory development and became a leading light. She moved on to the area of spectroscopic analysis uh, and, and then uh, moved on again to um, a, a team called Team Pigment, where those skills were used in understanding uh, the um, investigation of pigments, in, particularly in, in medieval manuscripts, which is what we're going to hear about tonight. So Kate has, has appeared on a number of occasions on BBC's Fake or Fortune, uh, which, which is able, obviously, using her expertise to say something about the potential authenticity or not of uh, famous paintings. Uh, for example. So delighted to have Kate with us tonight. So I'm going to shut up, uh, switch my camera off and hand over to Kate. Well, thank you very much for the kind introduction and welcome everybody. And tonight's lecture, Look But Don't Touch, is really the key thing when it comes to investigating medieval manuscripts. I mean, I'm sure you've seen on the television people handling antiquities with white gloves on. That's not the way you deal with old medieval manuscripts. Parchment, that would leave uh, dust and lint on them, so skin on skin is the best way. But the rather you don't handle them too much, and they really don't want you to start scraping bits off them. Now, Team Pigment is a collaborative venture. It's between myself at Northumbria University and Professor Andrew Beebe and Richard Gameson at Durham University. Richard is our historical expert and Andy is a co-conspirator in chemistry who has all of the money to play with all the fancy little bits of kit. So you'll hear his name mentioned a few times throughout the talk. Now, how did all this begin and how did I get into it and come from crystal growth into medieval manuscripts? Well, there was an exhibition in Durham in 2013 and the research question was posed to us, can the pigments of these medieval manuscripts be identified without sampling them? On the little caveat that came with that was, by the way, you can't move the manuscript to the lab. The insurance costs involved in that, well, you don't want to know. That grew into a bigger and broader research question because it's all well and good looking at the pigments. That's been done before. We need to know more depth. And that turned into the question of how does pigment use change over time in the British Isles? And this exhibition was a perfect opportunity to study that. It's the first time that Northumbrian insular manuscripts had been reunited since they were written in the seventh and eighth century. Now, obviously we go do our work in the books and check out past papers and see what's been done before. And pigments have been analyzed for some 200 years by chemists. So Humphrey Davery went off to study the frescoes in Pompeii and with the minutest atoms took from the frescoes so as not to cause excessive damage, he performed chemical tests to identify what those pigments were made from. Moving forward through time, we start to get into examples where you don't have to take samples from the paints that you're sampling. And 
That was done using Raman microscopy. And the first documented case of this was in the early 1980s at the Louvre in Paris. Now, obviously, having used a lot of Raman spectroscopy myself, that was going to be my favorite technique of choice. So that's where the story began. Now, Raman spectroscopy is really good for analyzing some pigments, but it comes with a few words of caution. You have to be aware of the power you use. You have to be aware of the wavelength of light you use for your laser. There are other techniques that can be used in tandem with this. And these non-destructive analysis techniques I'll be talking about as a little diversion from the manuscripts themselves this evening. So we have multispectral imaging, good for looking at large areas. It applies to all pigments. And if you want a positive identification though, you need a second technique. Reflectance spectroscopy, useful for some pigments, but beware of the power you're using on the page. XRF gives you elemental analysis, the, uh, the elemental composition of what's under your instrument, but no information on the exact form that takes. So it's like a jigsaw puzzle where all of these pieces of information have to be taken and put together. Now, the first image that pops into a conservation scientist's head when you say you're going to shine a laser on their 1400 year old manuscript is quite possibly this one. No, Mr. Bond, you're going to die. Now, that is not what we intend to do. First of all, conservation scientists are very scary and rightly defensive of their collections. These are national treasures. We need to treat them with care and respect. So no burning holes in the manuscripts. What we actually mean is that a laser pointer that would typically be waved around in a lecture theater is over a hundred times more powerful than what we're going to be using. Why do we choose such a low power? I mean, surely shining more light onto something, you get more light back to analyze. Well, you don't want to damage what's there. You don't want to induce chemical changes in the pigments before you've actually analyzed them. And ideally, leave them intact for future generations to analyze. So Raman spectroscopy is a technique that's laser based. And one in every million photons of light, once they've hit the page, will bounce back with a slightly different energy and give you a vibrational fingerprint of the molecules on the page. It's kind of like walking into Costa with your 10 pound note and ordering a flat white. Your laser's the 10 pound note, you know exactly what the value is of that in your hand. You hand over your money to the barista, check your change and look it down in your hand and go four pounds 10, good gods, I must be in London. That was an expensive flat white. That's exactly what we're doing, only we're doing it with light rather than a 10 pound note and a coffee. Lots of coffees were consumed in the making of this research, however. So what dangers does this light pose to the molecules on the page? Well, you need to consider the effect of light on the pigments themselves. Some of them can be chemically changed just by using an intense light source on them. Red lead, realgar, azurite, they all absorb that light and can be damaged by it. Organic pigments, this beautiful illustration of David from the Durham Cassiodorus. Over time, when it's been on display, the deep purple of David's robes here has faded. So it's almost indistinguishable from the background. The red pigment, the red lead, however, hasn't been affected as much by this, but this is why we impose limits on how much light we can use on a manuscript or any historical artifact, even when it's just on display. We've learned from the lessons of the past. So let's go back to where all of this began. The very first book produced in England. This book, with the very cute name of Durham Cathedral Library A210, is the first set of fragment fly leaves of a book produced in this country. It is the oldest example we have. It was quite possibly produced by monks from Iona, either on, the, on Iona themselves, or as they traveled and brought 
their techniques and knowledge to Northumbria. Please note that the hole in the page was there before we took the laser to it. This is because parchment was such a valuable resource. If there was a damage to the skin of the animal when the parchment was being made and as it stretched in the drying process and a hole formed, they would still make use of that. It takes a lot of effort and money to raise the animal to make the parchment in the first place. Now, this manuscript teased me in the exhibition for three months. It was the one that I didn't manage to catch on the way in. So I had to wait just to find out what secrets it held. And finding out what secrets they held was not a small undertaking. If you want to take a scientific instrument to a manuscript, it required two engineers, three of the strongest chaps I could find, and one interfering professor. It took five days to move this instrument and settle it down in its new home in the medieval dungeon in the library. It had to have a few little engineering adaptations. So instead of a normal microscope, we had to engineer a table to support the manuscripts and be able to move them around underneath the microscope itself. You can see the obvious problem with this. There's only so far into the manuscript that you can actually get that microscope. So you're restricted to the very edges of the page as to where you can do your analysis. Now, luckily, a lot of the illustrations are on the edge where we can access. But in some cases, it could get quite frustrating, which is, uh, there's a pretty bit of pigment over there. I just want to look at it. Oh, no. No, the microscope won't reach it. So we had to wait and be patient. Again, patience is a key thing in research. But when you do get results, you get nice results. So this is the Raman spectra for the pigments on this earliest manuscript produced in the British Isles. And were there any surprises here for us? Well, Yes, there were in some respects. We see the orange pigment used in the spirals and in the letter is red lead, also known as minium, which is a form of lead oxide. Lead's found just down the road in Weardale. They can mine it there, process it, chemically oxidize it, and there we go, beautiful red pigment. That technology has been known since Roman times. So no surprise that it managed to make its way to the northeast of England in the sixth and seventh century. The yellow, orpiment and arsenic sulfide. Quite toxic. Definitely don't lick your paintbrush after you've been using this one. This one traveled. It's not available in the northeast of England. So where did it come from? Quite likely, geologically speaking, the only sort of known source in the United Kingdom is down in some tin mines in Cornwall. Unlikely, the kingdoms were at war at that point in history. Or it could have come all the way from the Rome itself, along with the text that this was copied from. So the trade route in the 6th and 7th century of the northeast of England stretches to Rome. So the pigment is telling us something about the historical context that this was written in. The blue pigment seen in the snake's head here and in the initial itself is indigo. Exactly the same pigment that's used in your Levi jeans. Now, you would think, okay, we've all seen Braveheart. We know where that one comes from. And yeah, indigo grows like a weed. I even have some grown in the back garden, but I've put it in a plant pot rather than let it spread across the entire back garden. I've not managed to extract the, the pigment from it yet. So give me another year. So we have pigments produced from plant material. The green in this part and the letter itself are a mixture of the indigo and the orpiment. And we can see this because 
the spectra has peaks shown the same as the indigo, and some of them that match those of the opamint. So we can make out combinations of pigment using this technique. So what's the next book that was produced in the northeast of England in the seventh century? This is why we have a Richard. Richard is a professor of the history of the book. Richard is a walking encyclopedia of medieval manuscripts produced in the British Isles. And in fact, globally. It's very useful because you can turn to him and say, okay, what else was produced at this point in history? What can we compare this to? What's the next thing on the list that we need to go and look at to see how the story evolves? And he's very good at knowing manuscripts that have a provenance, knowing where they've been kept, what hands they've passed through, and where they've originated from. So if we want to look at a particular production center and take a cross section through time as to how that evolved, we can do that because he can tell us where those manuscripts are located. So the next book, the one that the Lindisfarne Gospels was actually copied from, is the Durham Gospels. And that has the shelf mark A217. So what pigments did they use that were the same as the monks that brought that technology over from Iona? Well, we see that they've used the minium, the red lead, and they've also used the opamint. So that trade route is still open. We see a purple and a green pigment here. And this is where Kit started to cry a little bit because RAM spectroscopy is not good for every single pigment. There are two complications. One, fluorescence, particular problem for organic pigments, things that don't have metals in them. And the other one, for pigments that really absorb your laser light and don't let it get back out again. And that was the problem with the green pigment on this page. So another technique is needed to find out and positively identify those. The next book that we can look at produced in this region currently resides down in the Park Library at Corpus Christi College. And again, we see the same set of pigments. We see the green, we see the red lead, we see the opamint, and we see this purple pigment. Now, as a chemist, I wouldn't be doing my job if I didn't tip my hat to these medieval masters of the art. The red lead pigment that's synthesized is obviously made from the lead sulfide, which is then turned into white lead, usually by burying in horse manure and urine for six months. So not a pleasant process. This white lead is then taken and put into an oven and roasted in air at precisely the right temperature, 585 degrees C. If they didn't get it so precise and plus or minus five to 10 degrees either way, you would get a chemically different form of lead oxide. And we could see that in the Raman spectra. So the red lead that we produce, the minium, as the spectra shown on top here in red, if you slightly over roasted or under roasted your red lead, you would get a massacre or a litharge. And we can see that the peaks shift into different positions with the chemical changes in the pigment. Now, massico contamination in red lead is easily identified in Raman spectroscopy. The red lead that we see in the seventh and eighth century Northumbrian manuscripts is pristine. They were outstanding chemists. So, how do we know that? Well, a later book in the collection, this one probably produced in York. And we look here 
and see, okay, there's some red lead on the page. Great. And we scour around, find another little bit of red lead and go, oh, that bit's got some massacre in. And then Richard breaks the bad news to us that that is actually a later addition, a later annotation put in by another hand um, several centuries after the book was produced. They weren't quite as good with their chemistry because it contains massacre. So we can see from this peak here. Red lead, no sign of it, massacre. So clearly standards were slipping. So the main pigments that we see in the seventh and eighth century Northumbrian manuscripts, we have our red lead, our minium, we have our opament, we have our verdigris. Oh, I've spoiled the surprise now. That's the green pigment, commonly a corrosion pro product of copper. And we have indigo. If there are any sort of botany experts here wondering whether that comes from the tincture form or not, as a chemist, I can't tell you that. The molecule that is responsible for the color that we identify is the same in both plants. So I can't tell you which one it's extracted from. Maybe in future, I'll have better technology to do that. We shall see. So we can start making a little map as to which manuscripts were produced in which centers and what the pigments used in those centers commonly was. So that's the start of our little map in pigment mapping. Now, as I said, that was very convenient having that collection together all at once. So we could do that and look at all the Northumbrian Insular manuscripts that we could get our hands on. There's still two on the hit list. I'll let you know when I get me pause on them. But if we want to go and look at other manuscripts, then the equipment has to travel. And just moving the equipment from the chemistry building down to the library on the palace green was enough of a challenge. So portable equipment is going to be necessary. Now, I'm sure you often know that the difference between something portable and something that's lab grade is often you make sacrifices and compromises in the quality of data that you can get from it. I'm a bit of a perfectionist and I'm not willing to make those compromises. So technology has to be developed. And that's what we did. Yes, you can buy systems commercially. When I moved to Northumbria University, I was told, oh yes, we have a Raman instrument that you can use on uh, pigment analysis. Great, great news. So went and saw my friend, Justin, and he very kindly let me use his painting as a test piece. Unfortunately, the lowest power setting on this instrument was a little bit too high. The reason it stopped smoking is there's now a hole in Justin's painting. Now, we wouldn't be very popular if we did that to a manuscript. The Mr. Bond image would become a reality. Only I think that would be me. So it's always important to test things in the lab before you go and attempt this on a real piece of artwork. That wasn't a very important painting, just for the record, that the grumpy face was just fake. So obviously we have friends in the instrument manufacturing industry and we go to them and go, okay, I like this bit of your instrument. I like this bit of your instrument. I want to make one. And they go, mm, okay, but we'll, we'll let you sort of buy some things from us. So we bought the Hariba version of what's known as a superhead. And this is coupled to the laser and the spectrometer by fiber optics. So flexible light pipes for putting our laser onto the page and getting the information back off again. That means it can be mounted on a frame that can be built to any size, shape, orientation, and 
the camera is as good as the one that's in the benchtop instrument. So we're not compromising on the quality. It's also a lot more portable. It fits in two suitcases that can be dragged on the train and put in the back of a car and driven to the next library that we need to go and look at things. It can also be easily assembled by two people. It takes about 30 minutes. There's quite a few arguments break out as to who's doing what at any given stage of the process, but it's basically a grown-ups Meccano kit and great fun to do. The first question everyone's going to ask is why didn't you use a laptop kit? I wasn't thinking. That was the only one that had the software on for the camera. That's been sorted now. So we've made an improvement already just by going to the manufacturer and evolving the kit into a, the way that we want it. We've got that low laser power that we want because the laser is designed by us and we measured it in the lab on lots of samples before we even took it out into a library. But it does give the sensitivity that we need to identify those pigments. I did say I was a bit of a perfectionist. The commercially available equipment is good, but there's always one little niggling thing that you want better. So me and Andy argue, we upset the people in the workshops having to make us things machined from aluminium and we build a better version. So we have here, Team Pigments version of the Superhead, version two, and that's since evolved to have an endoscope camera here rather than this bulky microscope to take an image of where we're taking the measurement from. You can see comparing the size of the two that a smaller head gives a lot better access to any tight pages where the book really doesn't want to open more than this much. So you can get very close to the margins. And we also found that because we're operating at such low powers, what we see in our spectra are not what's published in the literature. They're not working under the same restrictions we are. <coughs> so we've created our own library as well as making use of those that exist from the mineralogical databases, from databases from other groups that study pigments. So the first step was the portable Raman spectrometer. I did say that we needed other techniques in our toolbox to get the full picture. So reflectance spectroscopy being the first. You're doing this all the time with your eyes. White light of all wavelengths of the spectrum is shining on an object. Some of that light's absorbed. What's not absorbed is scattered and reflected back at you. You see the color that's left over. All we're doing here is replacing the light source with the one that we can control and your eye with a spectrometer camera. And there are commercial systems available for this too. This is where looks can kill. Looks is the unit of measurement that conservation scientists use to determine light exposure limits for an object. And you can have a certain amount of looks on an object for a certain number of hours which is great, we try and work within that. However, most of the light sources used in these instruments continue into the near infrared. And Lux doesn't. Lux measures the response that the human eye would perceive. The human eye doesn't see into the near infrared. So we're putting a lot of energy in there that nobody's really paying attention to or measuring. And identities have been obscured to protect their reputations here. But thankfully, one of these researchers is working with us and questioned us, rightly so, is your laser going to damage our manuscripts? <coughs> no, well, prove it. So we proved it. We then asked, is your machine going to damage the manuscript? Well, no, well, how do you know? 
So we did the measurement. <coughs> Watch how the temperature rises at the spot where the measurement's taken. Over 20 degrees C in the eight seconds it takes to do the measurement. Now, while that might not damage the pigment directly just from the heat, it will cause thermal expansion and cracking. So you always have to be careful with the light exposure for many different reasons. This researcher has since complained to the manufacturer and got a better setup in terms of our illumination source, so it doesn't have this effect anymore. Now, while we liked that, we decided we wanted one that was gonna be just as good but we didn't have to hold it. We could put it on the same frame as our, our Raman instrument. And we used the Lancaster bomber design where the beams cross, you're at the right height to take the measurement. So two light sources coming in from either side, move the height and where the beams cross, you're taking the measurement through the fiber in the middle. Yeah. This allows us to have quite a large offset from the page, so we're definitely not touching. And we can get some nice results. It also allows quite a low power to be put on the page, but you do have to do this in the dark, like all spectroscopists. You can see here a selection of blue pigments that we've analyzed in the lab and the differences between them. Some of them have things in common, the step here, for example, or the absorbance down here. <coughs> but some of them are different enough to see just from this part of the spectrum. And that's where we needed this technique to analyze the green in our Durham Gospels. So it's not a Virgo, it's not a combination of indigo and orpiment, it is, in fact, a verdigree. So second technique required just for one pigment on the page. But wait, there's going to be more. Not satisfied with this, we wanted to go further into the infrared. Because that verdigree spectrum looks so similar to that azurite one, you can't tell the difference unless you get more information. So we went further and added another instrument to see further into the near infrared. And I threw down the gauntlet to Andy that I wanted to be able to sample both of them from the same spot. So we have a beam splitter taken two beams away, one for the near infrared, one for the visible part of the spectrum. Now we can see in azurite, two very distinctive bands in the spectrum. So it doesn't match that of the verdigree and we're never going to make that error. Same design as the original visible system, same standoff, no touching required. Two seconds later, you can tell what your pigment is just by the fingerprint. But wait, there's more. Both Raman and fiber optic spectroscopy are a point by point technique. If you to want to get a spectrum for an entire page of a manuscript, it would take quite a long time to scan it and stitch everything together. So what can we do? Well, we can use multispectral imaging or very soon we can use hyperspectral imaging. The principle of this is that we use an ordinary camera that's been modified so there are no filters cutting off the ultraviolet or infrared. You then apply a filter in front of the lens of the camera, selecting a very narrow band of wavelengths. So if we take our standard calibration card, as we take images through the different wavelengths, you can see 
how the pigments behave differently. This gives us a quick overview as to what areas of similarity we have and what areas of difference or areas of interest need sampling that might appear the same to our human eye. Quite often, the black pigments are the ones that are the trickiest here. So going back to our old friend, the Durham Gospels, we can see three different filters used here. And as we go into the near infrared, we see that the green is very dark. Standard copper-based pigment will absorb a lot of the infrared light. So it allows us a quick way of a first guess as to what our pigment might be. As with all of the rest of the equipment, we've made technological evolutions. We started off with a nice scientific camera, a nice lens, a nice little filter wheel with nine filters in, and an LED light source where we could select the light that we're illuminating with. And when money becomes no object and you get nice grants from the AHRC to invest in the research, you can go for the expensive version with the modified Canon camera, with proper LED light banks and a filter wheel with 12 filters in we're up to now. Or you can go for the budget version. This is a version made based upon a Raspberry Pi camera. So this research doesn't have to cost the earth. There are ways of getting the information you need for a very cash strapped conservation science budget. With a little bit of processing and principal component analysis with a little bit of clustering on the resultant data, you can make false color images from these and overlay them on the original image. So this map of Mundi, map of the world, that's in a 12th century manuscript, we can see contains lapis, orpiment, and a copper-based green pigment. We can then go and verify this with the other two techniques. So back to our Northumbrian story. Well, after the seventh and eighth centuries, there's not really a lot to tell because the Vikings came along. And book production in Northumbria stopped. <sighs> Poor little monks. Picked up their manuscripts, threw them in St. Cuthbert's coffin and liked it. Spent a bit of time in Chesterley Street on the run and eventually they settled down in a bend in the River Weir. And they built, well, eventually they built a cathedral. They built a nice little church before they built this one. The nice little church had the problem of it was built just at the point where there was another set of invaders landing. And these ones brought their own monks. They took over the monastery and we're under new management. We know we're under new management because the monks wrote it down. And this is possibly one of the oldest history books I've had the privilege of having in my hand. This is written by Simeon of Durham. And this page is detailing William de Saint Calais taking over the Bishop and Principality of Durham and how they're building a magnificent new church in his honor. That one. This was also the first manuscript that I ever got to analyze. So it holds a special place in my heart and obviously the logo of Team Pigment. What we see here is not only a change in management of Durham, but we also see a change in pigments that accompanies it. Simeon was a Norman monk that spent the rest of his life in Durham. But the trade that he brought with him and the technology that he brought with him was a new set of pigments. We see the use of lapis lazuli for the blue. 
we see vermilion for the red, produced from cinnabar. And we see orpiment. We also see orpiment painted over these other pigments and we see them blended together. So we see an evolution in artistic style. That's driven by the chemistry. The reason being, if you use minium as your red pigment and orpiment, lead oxide plus arsenic sulfide gives lead sulfide, galena, the black ore that you started off with. And that happens on the page just when the two of them are in contact. So was the insular manuscript style just for artistic purposes? Or was it because they didn't want to mix those pigments together and ruin their beautiful artwork? Introduction of these new chemicals allows a different artistic style. So we see change in the art with the change in the technology. We also see an expansion of the trade routes. Only known source of lapis lazuli at that point in history was Afghanistan, traded in through the Silk Road. The source of cinnabar quite likely coming in from Spain. So a huge expansion for items that are used here in Durham. I always like to include this because it does show the sort of life of a research scientist. We have here the PhD student grinding away in the lab, making the pigments and the supervisor, all glamorous with a shell painting away. So we know who does all the hard work. Now with this change in pigments, we start to see introduction of others. We do see the occasional use of azurite and Egyptian blue. I did say we'd mention Egypt in this presentation. So what do we do next? Well, Northumbria is not really a huge production center anymore. However, the monasteries down in Canterbury and Winchester in the 9th and 10th century managed to weather the storms of the Viking invasions. So we need to go there to fill that little gap in our history book. Now, the most common blue pigment found in 11th century Canterbury manuscripts is lapis lazuli. There are a few examples contained in azurite. There's very limited use of indigo, the blue pigment that was commonly used in Northumbrian manuscripts. In the literature, however, there's a few reports of Egyptian blue being found in the manuscripts. Why is this unusual and where did it come from? Well, Egyptian blue is the first synthetic pigment known to humanity, made by heating lime, sand and copper to a high temperature. The technology was developed by the ancient Egyptians around 2500 BC. There are many examples of Egyptian artwork contained in this pigment. The technology was assumed to be lost, possibly in Italy around sort of 75 BC. It's certainly not being made in 10th century Canterbury. Now, we found, I think we're now up to 19 books with links to Canterbury with this pigment in so far out of the 56 surviving examples. So has it been a contaminant in the lapis supply? Has somebody cut their lapis just to make it go a little bit further? What was it being more expensive than gold? Was this even done on the trade route on the way to making its way to Canterbury? We might never know the answer to that last question. But what we can do is look and see what trends are happening. Is it just a one-off? Is it random? And it appears to be quite random and sporadic to where the Egyptian blue turns up in the lapis. We also see that sea change from the use of our minium red lead 
as our red of choice and the takeover of Vermilion. There's also quite an absence of orpiment in the early 10th century Canterbury manuscripts. And this coincides with the wars going on in Europe at that point in history, disrupting trade from Rome. One book, however, that I've waited quite a while to get my hands on is this one. Junius 27 in the Bodleian Library. Produced around the same time as Simeon was writing his history of Durham, it was produced in Winchester. So different batch of monks. Doing the realm and spectra of this, we see the robes here are produced from indigo. However, the blue in this initial didn't give me a good realm and spectrum. I did have an oh hello moment with this little tail, however. Why? Because that was hinting that it was fluorescent. So switch the camera on, check in the near infrared. Sure enough, it lights up like a beacon. Fluorescent in the infrared. Not a lot of pigments have that characteristic. That is shouting Egyptian blue and quite a lot of it too. So I reconfigured the spectrometer a little bit and measured the fluorescent spectrum of it. And the purple flat line is from the chap's robes, just as a double check that there's no Egyptian blue hiding in there. So we see this fluorescence, this emission of light in the near infrared when it's illuminated by normal light. Very unusual. But just seeing fluorescence there, it's not quite enough proof. To prove what your pigment is by fluorescence, you need its fluorescence lifetime, how long it emits for. And Egyptian blue emits for a very long time. So again, I went back to the lab, had a little bit of an argument with Andy, and magically an Egyptian blue detector appeared. So this is dedicated just for measuring the fluorescence lifetime of Egyptian blue. It's a time resolved measurement. So you illuminate with a pulse of light and measure the emission of photons after that. It also had to be low power. So we're making sure we're staying within our power limits again. And then we went and looked at the book that contained Egyptian blue. Sure enough, we see a fluorescence decay with a lifetime of around 100 microseconds. So we can prove that we've got Egyptian blue. That's going to be coming to a paper soon, but that is where I'm going to take a little breath and summarize what lessons I've learned over the past nine years of working in this field. Work collaboratively. If it wasn't for the fact that we had Richard as a walking encyclopedia of where these manuscripts are, we would just be looking at stamp collecting manuscript pages of pretty pigments. The reason that we can ask those deeper questions as to where the manuscripts came from, what else was produced at this time? Is this common for this monastery? Is this a significant event in history that's happening to cause the cease of trade that brings in the orpiment? Where are they getting this Egyptian blue from? Apparently there was an obelisk in the center of Canterbury that had Egyptian blue on it at one point. You never know, supplies might be getting short, out with your chisel and hammer. Make sure that that research question is well informed because that is the way to get funding from all of our lovely grant um, funders. Know what your power limits are. It would be really good to be able to sort of get beautiful measurements and turn up the light intensity, but knowing what's safe for your object and working far below that limit is far safer and future proof than that for generations to come who might find out a way to work out a perfect identification take for that 
pesky purple pigment. Always test your equipment before you use it. We don't want any smoking holes in our manuscript. And if in doubt, the object's going to outlast you. It's lasted for thousands of years already. Some clever person will come along and develop the technology that will find your answer. So just be patient for it. You don't have to have all the answers right now. I owe a huge debt of gratitude to all of the people on this slide, all of the libraries that have let me in to look at their collections and all of the people that have funded this research. Um, couldn't have done it without them. I'm obliged to put up the copyright acknowledgement for the images featured in this presentation from Durham University Library, Corpus Christi College, Dean and Chapter of Durham Cathedral, British Library, Bodleian Libraries, Oxford, and the Wren Library, Trinity College, Cambridge. And the slide that I've been flashing back to, well, there is a little caveat at the bottom. XRF coming soon. Portability of XRF, the equipment exists, but health and safety concerns are an issue. You need to set up a protected area for using this equipment. And that is something that just takes time. We have the equipment ready to go. So fingers crossed, there'll be more results on that front coming soon. And one final word of warning. When you have your beautiful manuscripts in your collection, and this one was in the collection of Sir Thomas Horsley, the founder of the Newcastle Grammar School in the 16th century. Beware of doodling in the manuscripts because some crazy chemist 400 years down the line is going to come and look at the manuscript and go, goodness gracious me, what a self-portrait there. I wonder if I can tell the difference between the ink in the Canterbury and his. And that's the question I'm going to look for in the XRF. I hope you've enjoyed this talk and 200 years of chemists looking at pigments. And if anyone has any questions, please, I would love to answer them. Thanks so much, Kate. That was absolutely fascinating, a brilliant talk and, and really interesting to see how chemistry, physics work together here uh, in, in actually sort of really unveiling the history behind these manuscripts. So I'm, I'm, I'm delighted to see we've already got three questions in the Q&A box. I think, Bethany, people can raise their hand and ask the questions verbally as well. Is that possible? Anyway, yeah. 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 So, so either either pop your question in the Q and A or raise your hand, and we'll make sure your question is asked. Mm -hmm. So, um, I'll start by um, putting the questions to Kate. From uh, in fact, Alex has got all three questions in the Q and A box at the moment. So, question one from Alex Wood, Kate. How do you determine the maximum safe power that you that could be used and how close to that limit do you go? Um, maximum safe power, we do tests in the lab. So the most sensitive pigment we look at is Realgar, which is a different crystalline form of orpiment. So it looks orange to the eye. And most of what you see in anything that's been on display is para a different chemical form. What we can do is we can look at a freshly produced sample of Realgar and see the peaks in that spectrum and then slowly increase the laser power until we see it start to change and those two peaks disappear and a fresh one appears. So that is the one that we set our limits by. And we work about an order of magnitude below that limit. Okay. Thanks. And how many surviving medieval manuscripts in the UK and beyond? Yeah, that's the next one, yeah. It depends what period of history um, and what location you want them originating from. So fifth century, I think there are six 
surviving manuscripts in the world from that time. Four of three of them in the UK, the remaining ones in the Vatican Library. Um, seventh and eighth century, you're talking about, I think it's just 20 or 30 or so. Um, ninth century, 60, 70, and then the numbers start going up from there. And the change in artistic style that I mentioned. Yeah, so I can skip back through my slides. Sorry, give me laptop a moment to catch up. This one's probably the best one to illustrate. So even looking down the microscope at this one, you can see that all the areas of pigment have a black line or an area of blank parchment between that line and the pigment to keep them separated. And a lot of insular art is very much using that technique for all the pigments, not just the ones that they know is going to go black. So it's consistent across the whole thing. But when you get to Simeon, oh, come here, little Simeon. We have here an overpainting of the lapis with the orpiment. And we've got white lead used as a pigment rather than just leaving gaps on the parchment. Despite the fact that they could make white lead on the route to making the red lead, they didn't really use it much until about the 10th century as a pigment in its own right. They just left blank parchment for the white. And it's the blending of the pigments. So the lighter blues here are achieved by mixing the lapis with the lead white. If they don't chemically interact, it's safe to do that to get a different coloration. Prior to that, the pigments were used in their own right as a pure color and just one pigment within it. Hope that answers your question a little bit. Thanks, Kate. At the moment, uh, we've not got any other questions or hands up, but uh, give people a minute or two. I've got a couple of questions in the meantime. One which is very much physics and one which is uh, completely nothing to do with physics. Just So you, you, you mentioned your multispectral imaging and you talked about actually imaging in narrow wavelength bands. Mm -hmm. so, so how narrow are those bands typically? Uh, 10 nanometers, full width half max on the bands and it's in 50 nanometer increments from 400 nanometers up to about 850. And then we've got a um, two edge passes for the UV and the near infrared. Okay, thanks. And then the other one, right back at the start of your talk, you was talking about the red lead, the mini minium and saying how difficult that was to, you were saying, you know, kudos to the, the, the monks because it was really difficult to actually make that um, mm -hmm. and you said you know if I, if I remember correctly you said that it had to be the base material had to be heated to exactly to 585 degrees celsius mm -hmm. so have you got have, how have, exactly how how <laughs> did you know they wouldn't have had a thermometer that they could put in and say oh we're there take it off the heat so how did they know where they got there with other visual clues or or what or is it, is it a bit of a mystery? It's a bit of a mystery. I don't know whether there was a visual clue. I don't even know the style of furnace that they would have been using to do that. Um, I don't know of any re um, archaeologi archaeological reproductions of that either for the pigment manufacture. There may be some out there. I'm more than happy to take a call from anyone who does know. <laughs> It just sounds absolutely fascinating, as you say, you know, it's such a difficult thing to do and you've got none of the sort of modern technology to help you to get to the end product. Mm. Anyway, so another another question of Alex. Um, you may, you know, you might, I don't know whether you want to answer this one or not. You mentioned equipment costs. Can you give us some rough figures? I guess ballpark figures of, uh, you know, XREF or XRF or whatever. What, what are you talking? Um, XRF. Oh, probably about 70, 80,000 pounds for some of the fancier Raman cameras, same ballpark. Um, you can get cheaper ones there. You can make compromises 
there are cheap multispectral imaging systems out there. There are expensive multispectral imaging systems out there. It really just depends on how much money you have in your pocket and how deep your pockets are. Is, is it fair to say you probably pay a premium by, by requiring something that's relatively portable? Yes and no. We, we pay a premium for the quality and resolution that we want to achieve. Okay. Um, we pay less of a premium for portability because we've developed the instruments from the components rather than just buying a, a system that's been made for that purpose, with the exception of XRF. I'm not that brave. <laughs> so we've got another question that's coming from, from Akhil. Um, how detailed was David's work into pigments and is it possible to read the paper you showed uh, extracts for? Yes, the paper is available online. I think it's an open access one, given the age of it. Let's get back to it. Ooh, too far. So proceedings, I'll type it in the text box if I can get the reference and then we can get that. Done. Copy, type answer. That should have sent directly. Fabulous. Yeah, no, it's gone into the answer box now. Uh, so a royal, of course, proceeding to the Royal Society couldn't be anything else, could it really, I guess? Yeah. Uh, fabulous. And then uh, probably a final one from Alex, uh, if nobody else has got anything. Uh, and that is, how many other team pigments are there at other universities in the UK and elsewhere? There can be only one. <laughs> 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 no, there is um, a group in Cambridge that we work very closely with. Um, so the Fitzwilliam Museum and there's Cambridge University's group as well that do this sort of work. Um, we do we do collaborate with them quite often. There are other team pigments in essence looking at different types of materials. So I think there's a textiles group up in Glasgow as well. Um, they've looked at some of the work on um, the Robert Burns forgeries as well. I've done a bit of collaboration with them with that. Yeah. There are individual little groups doing individual pieces of work, but none that are portable like Team Pigment is. And how about internationally? I mean, is there anything in the... Internationally, there's more lab. They are portable. You can phone more lab and bring them in. There is another collaborative group of people who do the imaging work at Rochester. So that's made a, a, up of a lot of other groups. And we meet every Friday night for, well, either breakfast for the people in Hawaii to beers in the evening for the people in the UK and Poland. You might naively think Greek and Egyptian manuscripts. Is there anybody looking at those? Um, the Americans from Rochester do a lot of work at Mount Sinai with the um, manuscripts there. Egyptian, I don't know how many people do those ones or which groups do those. Um, and then there's quite a few groups in Europe who do not just manuscripts, but they do artwork, frescoes, triptychs, things like that. So there's couple of groups in Italy, a couple of groups in the Netherlands, scattered, scattered all over really Ghent. Yeah. So yeah, but, quite a lot of people do this sort of thing. But the basis is in terms of the underlying physics technology you're using is very similar in, in most of the cases, is it? Yeah. Yeah. Most, of, most people use one or two of the techniques that we do. Um, more lab are probably the only ones that have all of the techniques in their tool bag right so okay thanks kate so i think we've probably got through all the questions i don't see any unanswered questions and i don't see any hands up so i just want to say on behalf of you know a the uh iop yorkshire branch but also everybody who's called in tonight thank you so much for an absolutely fascinating talk absolutely thoroughly enjoyed it uh, really interesting to see uh, that you know what a fascinating application of uh, the different techniques, Ram and et cetera. 
Um, so I'm just going to wrap up now by just letting everybody know that the next uh, of these is going to be on March the 17th, uh, at which point we're going to um, welcome uh, Carolyn Crawford from Cambridge, and she's going to be talking about a universe of galaxies. But on that note, I'd thank Kate again and uh, wish you all a good evening and uh, keep safe and well if you have to travel tonight. Okay, bye for now.